please give your full attention and ear and a warm reality welcome to Alex Zabel. Appreciate it. You know you're in church when every announcement has to do with food. Uh, Do you notice that? Uh, to be honest, I, don't, I didn't hear anything after chocolate chip cookies, so apparently I picked the perfect Sunday to be here with you guys, but how's everyone doing today? Now, I thought surely there would be a lot more enthusiasm in it, especially for those parents of little kids whose kids are about to go back to school. Woo! Parents, so how are you this morning? You're speechless. They, okay, I'll, I'll take that. And for those of you who are into football? Yes. All right, there we go. Um, now, I could use your prayers this morning. I am a self-admitted Dallas fan. Try, hey, we're in church. Normally, Dallas at least waits three to four games into the season before they completely obliterate all of my hopes and expectations of winning another title. This year, they decided to do it in three snaps. Um, Pun intended, I suppose. Uh, But I could use your prayers uh, this year for Dallas. It's going to be a rough one, so pray for me. And I would appreciate it. I would appreciate it. Well, I am glad to be here with you this morning. As your pastor mentioned, uh, we are classmates. And I remember... um, my first class at Regent, just kind of sitting in there and just taking it all in. And I remember hearing this guy next to me kind of tell the story of how he just felt that God was calling him to make this decision, and it was a difficult decision. He didn't really understand all that pertained or all that, you know, that uh, would entail with that decision, but I know that he had decided to be obedient no matter what. And that decision ultimately led to him being the pastor of your church. So I I know you're excited that he he made that decision. And it was kind of neat. I just discovered just a few months ago what it actually took place as a result of it. But it's it's exciting when you see how God moves, isn't it? It doesn't always move the way that we expect or when we would expect or how we would expect. But God always has a plan. Well, if you have your Bibles with you this morning, if you go ahead and turn to the book of John in chapter 21. That is the book of John chapter 21, and you can go ahead and go down towards verse 15. That's where we're going to pick up in just a few moments. John 21, 15. And we're going to kind of track this morning with the life of Peter. I believe that when you and I, when we look at Peter and his ministry with Christ, that we have a lot in common with Peter, more than we would possibly like to admit sometimes. But there's a lot of similarities between Peter's life and Peter's ministry and how you and I are today. And and you remember when Peter first encountered Christ. You probably are familiar with the story. But Peter had been out there kind of with his boys hanging out fishing all night. And then here comes this rabbi. He comes walking along the shore and he kind of yells out to him and says, Hey guys, have you caught anything? And Peter's response was, We've fished all night and we've caught what? Nothing. Nothing. And so here's Jesus, as far as they know, not skilled in fishing, but he says, Hey guys, why don't you just take the nets and just throw it on the other side? And Kind of sounds kind of dumb, doesn't it? You know, here's experienced fishermen. They've been fishing for their lives. That's their trade. And and just take the net that you've been fishing with and throw it just a few feet on the other side of the boat. And Peter kind of debated a little bit. And finally he said, you know, nevertheless, we've done everything, but we'll do what you ask, my paraphrase. And so they take the net and they throw it on the other side. And the Bible says that there was such a large catch that the nets began to break. And it was at that moment that Jesus kind of caught Peter's attention And Peter recognized how sinful he was and how perfect Christ was. And and Jesus at that moment said to Peter, said to this regular guy from this small, obscure fishing village, a kind of just a regular guy, Jesus says to Peter, follow me and I will what? I will make you a fisher of men. And so Peter leaves everything and begins to follow Christ. And I'm sure that he had no idea what this journey was going to look like. He had no clue of all of the highs and the lows and the different experiences that he would see as part of, as being a Christ follower. And so here's Jesus at the first miracle. If you remember, the Bible talks about the marriage feast and how Jesus turned the water and he, and he turned it into wine. And, and you can just see the disciples, they don't really fully get what's going on at this particular moment. But I'm sure things are starting to click just a little bit when they experience that first miracle. Or when Peter was there, when 
Jesus fed the multitudes with just a couple fish and some loaves of bread, 5,000 men besides women and children, thousands of people, Jesus fed them with just a kid's lunch. And shortly after that, Jesus tells the disciples to go ahead. And, and so they begin to row across the sea. And later on that night, as they're encountering this incredible storm where they feel like their lives are threatened, here comes Jesus just walking on the water. The disciples freak out. They think it's a ghost. And when they recognize, though, that it's Christ who's walking towards them, it's Peter who says, Lord, if that's you, would you let me come? Jesus said to him, come. And it was Peter, although we tend to criticize him all the time, but it was Peter who stepped out of the boat and was the only one to experience what it would have been like to walk on water. He was there at the tomb when Lazarus had been dead for four days and everyone had given up hope. Peter was there. And he saw Jesus as he commanded them to remove the stone. And he saw Lazarus, who had been dead for four days, come walking out of a tomb. Could you imagine that? How incredible. He was there as they took the grave clothes off. And this guy who was dead and gone is now alive and walking around. Peter was there for all of that. He was there when Jesus asked the question to everyone, who do people say that I am? And the disciples kind of gave their answers, and Jesus said, but who do you say that I am? And it was Peter who said, I believe that you're the Christ, the Son of the living God. It was also Peter when Jesus was explaining the fact that he was going to have to suffer and die. It was Peter who said, essentially, not on my watch. And Jesus had to rebuke him and say what? Get behind me, Satan. And so Peter's journey with Christ was full of all kinds of different experiences. He was there in the upper room when they discovered it would be Judas who would betray him. He was there in the garden who when Christ was talking to them and, and Jesus said that you're all going to leave me, it was Peter who said, I will never leave you. I'll give my life for you. And then when asked to pray, when Jesus needed him the most, Peter was one of the three that fell asleep. And Jesus came back to him a second time and says, guys, I asked you to pray. That you're, if you don't pray, you're going to enter into temptation. And he went off to pray and Peter fell asleep again. You remember the story. It was Peter who, when the crowd led by Judas came to arrest Christ, and they were getting ready to take him away, it was Peter who took his sword out and cut the ear off of the high priest's servant. You remember that. He didn't quite get the full picture of what was going on, and Jesus had to explain to him that this is not what it was all about. Me coming, it, it was different than what you expected. He was there for that. He saw as they led Christ away, as the trial went on, he denied Christ three times that night before the rooster crowed, just like Jesus had said. He knew that Christ was crucified. He heard the story of how he had risen again, how the tomb was empty, and ran to kind of check it out for himself. And you can just imagine all the stuff that's kind of going on in Peter's mind as he's failed Christ, as he hears how Christ is risen again, how when Mary told him to meet together in the room, there comes Christ who's alive. He walks into the room. I mean, you can just imagine the emotion of what he may have been thinking throughout all that he had experienced. He had seen it all. But yet there still, to me, seems like something was missing. There was something that was ju just a little bit off in Peter's heart. And so one day he says to his, his buddies again, he goes, guys, I don't know about you, but I'm going fishing. And they say, well, we're going with you. And just as before, these guys fished all night and they caught what? Kind of like me on the Chesapeake Bay Bridge Tunnel. <laughs> there for hours, I catch nothing. They caught nothing. And here comes Christ. They don't know who he is, but he walks along the shore and he says, hey, kids, have you caught anything? Kind of deja vu, right? They're like, we've fished all night, we've caught nothing. He says, why don't you just take the nets and throw it on the other side? And so they did. And the Bible says that they caught such a large catch, but this time the nets did not break. John recognized who it was on the shore and said, it's the Lord. And Peter, you can just imagine his heart kind of beating out of his chest, literally launches himself off of the boat. He's got to get to Jesus. There's still something he's struggling with, I believe. And he swims ashore. And that's where we pick up in our text this morning. Jesus made them breakfast. So if you have your Bibles with you, John 21, 15, it says this. It says, when they had finished breakfast, 
Jesus said to Simon Peter, Simon, son of John, do you love me more than these? He said to him, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. He said to him, feed my lambs. He said to him a second time, Simon, son of John, do you love me? He said to him, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. He said to him, tend my sheep. He said to him the third time, Simon, son of John, do you love me? And he said to him, Lord, you know everything. You know that I love you. Jesus said to him, feed my sheep. Truly, truly, I say to you, when you were young, you used to dress yourself and walk wherever you wanted. But when you are old, you will stretch out your hands and another will, will dress you and carry you where you do not want to go. This he said to show by what kind of death he was to glorify God. And after saying this to him, he said, follow me. Follow me. Kind of deja vu again, isn't it? If you remember, at the very beginning when they first met, Jesus' words to Peter were what? Follow me. And here we are. A lot of life has happened. It's been about three years, and Peter has, has had all kinds of incredible and difficult experiences to walk through. And yet, the words that Christ spoke to Peter at the beginning are the same words that he said to him after all of that's taken place. Follow me. But what does it mean to follow Christ? I think sometimes in, in churches, it's easy for us to get this kind of obscure idea as to what it really means. What does following Christ mean? Does that mean just I, I go to church on Sundays? Does it mean if I kind of have some sort of devotional that I'm following Christ? If I, you know, read my Bible, if I make sure I spend some time in prayer, if I'm here for the setup team, is that what that means? Am I following Christ when I do those things? So I did some studying. When you look in context, when you see what follow me would have meant to these disciples, it's a whole lot more than just calling ourselves Christians and saying that we have a relationship with Christ. You see, these Hebrew kids at a very, very young age, they would have gone to school, and their main textbook would have been the Torah. And so they were taught the Old Testament. They had to memorize large portions of the Torah. This was just a big deal. It was foundational to their training. But there were some students who really excelled in their studies, who really had this fire in their soul, this passion, if you will, and who really aspired to be what most young Hebrew men would aspire to be, and that was to be a rabbi. They wanted to be a rabbi. That was the position of all positions. And so if they excelled in their studies, they would go on to another level of education where the rest of the Hebrew boys would have gone into their father's trade. So if their dad was a carpenter, they would become carpenters. If their dad was a fisherman, they would become fishermen. That was kind of standard. But for these young boys, they would go to the next level, and they would begin to listen to rabbis interpret scripture or rabbi debate rabbi just at their different viewpoints. And they would just continue to learn and to study, and they would learn the prophets and other portions of the Old Testament. They would just engulf themselves in study. And out of that group, there would be a very select few who felt like their fire, their passion, their dream was they, they needed to move on. They were going to be a rabbi one day. And so what they would do is they would find a rabbi that they truly respected, and they would go up to the rabbi and say to him, I want to be like you. And so that rabbi would then begin to question them, to kind of, you know, really put them to the test to see if they were worthy enough to be their disciple. And so that rabbi, once he would go through that process, if he didn't feel like the student met his expectations, he would say, it's probably better if you would go into your father's trade, which to that young man would have been a devastating blow. But to those who the rabbi thought was worthy, he would say, you can be like me. And that student would then move in with the rabbi and just begin to observe the rabbi in all of his dealings. So he would watch how the rabbi was as a husband. He would watch how he was as a father. He would, he, he would watch how the rabbi modeled his business affairs and all of his dealings to the point where he would literally begin to mimic his actions and his speech. So that if you were to see this disciple out in the marketplace, they could tell you just by watching him, which rabbi he was following. And so they knew. They knew. And getting to this point was kind of like in our day and age, it'd be like some of us making it to the NFL. Very, very, very few made it to that point. And so Jesus, now that was the model, the elite of the elite, to approach the elite rabbi and to want to be his disciple. But Jesus kind of flips it a little bit, doesn't he? 
Instead of waiting for the best and the brightest and the elite of society to come to him, Jesus goes to this little fishing village in Galilee, to this tiny town, to these regular guys who, in the world's eyes, didn't make it. They're just fishermen. And Jesus says to Peter, you can be like me. He knew who he was, and he knew he had the ability to enable Peter to be like him. He had faith, he had trust, and he believed in Peter. And so that's encouraging. I don't know about for you, for you, but it encourages me this morning that God doesn't just allow the elite of the elite to come to him and invite him on the journey. God goes to the regular people. He goes to you and he goes to me and he says, you can be like me. And so following him really is all inclusive. It's not a Sunday morning deal. Following Christ means to mimic everything that he modeled for us. So when he loved the unlovable, that should define you and me as well. He was willing to associate with people that no one else was willing to associate with. He prayed for people who were struggling. He prayed for people to be healed. He shared the gospel everywhere he went. You understand, following Christ is so much more than a Sunday morning deal. It's every moment of our lives. It's loving my wife as Christ would have me to love her. It's being the kind of dad that's certainly not without failures. If anyone, you've blown it as a parent. Don't lie in church. You can go ahead. Um, but the idea is to strive to be like him in every area, in every aspect, whether we're at work, whether we're with our neighbors, wherever we go, to be like Christ, to have that fire, to have that passion to be like him. And so when Jesus said to Peter and reiterated the fact that, Peter, I've called you three years ago to follow me, and in spite of everything that's gone on, in spite of everything, that call remains. Your primary responsibility is to follow me. In spite of the fact, Peter, that you have had unmet expectations. Have you ever had certain expectations as to the way you think God should move or God should do things? Have you ever felt like maybe God let you down? I mean, let's be honest. Two of you. The rest of you will experience it if you haven't. So we have these expectations. But when you look in context here for Peter, Peter had expectations as to what the Messiah was going to be like and what he was going to do. All Jews of his day did. They thought that the Messiah was going to come and deliver them from Roman rule and oppression. You see, Israel was subdued by Rome. They were calling the shots. In, in fact, Israel couldn't even perform certain judicial tasks without approval from Rome. Certainly, people had been killed. Certainly, they were oppressed. And they thought that when the Messiah came, all that was going to change. He was going to restore Israel back to the glory days to where they were the prominent nation in all of the world. And so they had this idea as to how God was going to move and what he was going to do. And no doubt Peter felt that same way. But it didn't play out that way. Jesus didn't come to deliver them from Roman's rule, or Rome's rule. He came to deliver them from their sin, from the bondage that was holding the world captive. His plan was much better. But sometimes I think in churches we have these expectations, and I don't know if it's because when someone shared the gospel with us, they painted this rosy picture. Like maybe someone told you if you ask Christ into your life, you'll never have any problems. That all of your prayers, they're going to be answered before you finish praying. Your marriage will be perfect. Your kids, before you even finish a sentence, they're going to obey you. They just know what you want. But sometimes we have these expectations. God, I, I thought it was going to play out this way, but here I am in this situation. Here I am in this circumstance. God, I'm struggling financially. I'm struggling in my marriage. My kids, they don't want anything to do with me. We have these expectations. This was about 10 years ago, almost exactly 10 years ago. I was an associate in Connecticut, and uh, I was running the children's ministry. And every year on Halloween, we would put on this harvest party, just kind of, I'm sure you're familiar with it, an alternative for the kids on Halloween, and we would just do it up really big and kind of make it this community event and invite people who, whether they came to the church or not, we just kind of tried to make a big deal over it. And this particular year, we had things up and going, and the kids were having fun, and I didn't really have good cell phone service, 
Uh, but I noticed a little bit later on I had missed a call, and so I, I listened to the voicemail. And on the other end, I heard my aunt say, your mom is not doing very well. She's at the hospital. You need to get there right away. And so I had good people taking care of the event, and I left and I went to the hospital only to discover that my mom had passed away. And it was a very difficult time. I loved my mom, and there were a lot of struggles that she had at that particular time, but completely unexpected. And, and that was that. My mom was gone. Just three months after that, I'm not sure if you've heard of Upward Basketball, but I used to run one of those programs uh, in Connecticut. And if you're not familiar with it, it's just a sports league designed to share Christ with people and to create this incredible atmosphere. And so we kind of made it like the NBA for kids, spotlights, disco lights, announcements. I mean, you name it, we did it. But the point of the entire season, the culmination of everything is the award night. And it's that night where you invite everyone in the community, family, friends, you name it. You try to bring everyone in an auditorium. And we flew in this guy who knew how to kind of entertain the crowd and who would also share the gospel. I mean, it was everything that we had worked towards. And at 8.30 on the morning of the event, I got a phone call from a different aunt. And she said, your brother was just murdered. And it's like, Lord, you know, I don't understand. And I struggled. And it was difficult. It's like, God, you know, not that I ever thought that because I served the Lord or I was involved in ministry that it meant that I wouldn't struggle in different ways or, you know, I didn't have those expectations, but, but Lord, on two separate occasions at two major events that we're putting on for you, I've had these two tragedies, and I'm thankful for a community and a church who loved me through it and were there for me, brought me through it. And God just, I was able to experience this measure of grace that I never would have otherwise. And he got me through it. But expectations. We think things should go a certain way. And, and I don't know about you, but I'm sure there's some struggles just by the nature of the world today. There are people in here this morning that you have gone through things that have been difficult. That maybe have gotten you sidetracked. Just Friday night, just to lighten things up a little bit this morning. Friday night I was... Um, over a friend's house, me and my family were playing uh, Family Feud, ironically enough. And um, as we're playing Family Feud, one of my boys um, had the opportunity to steal the card. And so we're kind of sitting bunched in together on the couch, and, and so it's his turn to answer. And when he answers, he gets it right. We steal the card, and in his excitement, he flies up like this and completely elbowed me in the eye. Now, he weighs about 200 pounds. He's a big boy. And he caught me square in the eye. Now, I know, I know you thought that probably was my wife. Um, what's this guy doing up on stage? He just got into a fight. Um, but unexpected. But, you know, doesn't life have a way of doing that? Catching you off guard, giving you a black eye. Things just happen that completely come out of the blue. It's that way. But we must understand that God's plan, God's purpose for our lives is so much greater than how we think it should go. Peter thought it was going to play out this way. God's plan was much greater. So I just want to encourage you this morning, no matter what you're going through and no matter what you're facing, if you feel like things have not gone the way that you expected, if you're still trying to figure things out, just know that God is working and that God has a plan and God will move on your behalf if you trust him. So Peter, follow me, even though your expectations aren't what you thought they would be. Follow me in spite of your failures. Anyone else ever sin or fail? Here we got more honest people. Good, I feel like I belong. <laughs> Peter's failure was a big deal. It was a big deal. He abandoned not just, it's one thing, you know, if you've ever let someone down, and all of us to some degree have let people down. But it's another thing when you feel like you've let down God. When you, the person who needed you the most in the garden, the person who needed you at the, the most during his trial and crucifixion, you had abandoned him. And no doubt he was there and heard Jesus speak the words and say that if you confess me before men, I'll confess you before my father. But if you deny me before men, I'll deny you before my father. He knew that. He knew that what he had done it was a horrible thing. And that's why the Bible says that he left and he wept bitterly. 
over what he had done. And that's why I believe that things just still weren't right in his heart. Why he just kind of left and said, guys, I'm going fishing. Something still wasn't right. And so all of us have been in those situations where we've failed, where we've sinned, where we've blown it. And it's very easy. You know, I've been around this thing long enough to know that the enemy really plays on us when we blow it. Have you ever been there this morning? He'll tell you that, you know, you have blown, you've crossed the line now. God is done with you. You know, you better just go find something else to do. And he discourages and he beats you up over what you've done over and over and over again. And even though we know Peter repented, there was still something there, and we wrestle with guilt, and God, could you ever use someone like me again, Lord? I've, I've done it a thousand times. Have you ever done the same thing? You don't have to raise your hand, but I've done the same thing over and over again and been like, Lord, if I were you, I'd be done with me. But the important thing this morning is not how many times you've fallen, but are you willing to get back up again? Because Jesus said to Peter, amen, he said to Peter, after all that had transpired, after everything that took place, you are still to follow me. He had not given up on Peter. In fact, when you look at the scripture, who was the one who initiated the restoration? Did Peter come groveling at his feet? Just know that it was Jesus who initiated the restoration process and had this conversation with Peter. And Peter had denied him three times, and yet three times Jesus said, do you love me? feed my sheep. I still have a plan. I still have a purpose. It doesn't matter what you've done, how many times you've fallen, God still has a plan and a purpose for you and for me today. In spite of our failures, follow me. Because they have a tendency to sidetrack us, don't they? And also, in spite of the distractions that are going on around us. Notice this, if you have your Bible still turned there, in verse 20, in the same chapter, right after Jesus told Peter to follow him, it says that Peter turned and he saw the disciple whom Jesus loved following them, the one who also had leaned back against him during the supper and had said, Lord, who is it that's going to betray you? When Peter saw him, he said to Jesus, Lord, what about this man? Jesus said to him, if it's my will that he remains until I come, what is that to you? And what does he say? Follow me. In other words, Peter, it's none of your business what goes on with anyone else. You have a responsibility, you have a duty to follow me. It's a command. You, Peter, follow me. Don't worry about what's going on with John. You have a responsibility. And aren't we in a world full of distractions? I'm here to tell you this morning, don't worry about the election. Don't worry about Trump or Hillary. Well, actually, I take that back. Um, Maybe we should really pray. Um, Can I be honest? Yeah. We should pray for our nation But there's so many distractions. There are so many things vying for your attention, for my attention. And it's easy to look to other people and wonder, God, what about them? You're doing this in their life, God. You're doing that. Look at the people on stage. They're so talented. Lord, I can't even sing in the shower. And we get distracted. And again, it has a tendency to take our focus off of what really matters, which is our pursuit of being like Christ in every way. You see, God did not give you someone else's gift. God has equipped you uniquely and specifically for a purpose. And he has a call on everyone's life who's in this building this morning, something special that he has set aside for you to do. And he has given you gifts and abilities to carry that out, whether it's setting up on a Sunday morning like your pastor was mentioning, whether it's teaching in the children's ministry, whether it's helping in the youth. It doesn't matter what it is. The fact is, is that it's all just as important as the person who's up on stage because this is all about being part of a team that accomplishes the will of God on this earth. It's about us together finding our unique lane that God has called us to walk in and fulfilling together the purposes of God that he has called for us to fulfill. God has a plan. God has a purpose. So whatever has you distracted this morning could be a financial situation, could be a a number of things. But we need to remain focused. What he said to Peter in the beginning is the very same thing that he said to Peter after everything went down. A lot of life had happened in the middle, but the calling was the same. You are to be my disciple. You are to follow me. You are to represent me so that when you're at work, people might say, I can tell that they're a Christian by the way they live. They're not a part of this or they 
they speak a certain way or they share their faith with me. There should be some distinct characteristics that would set us apart so that people would know there's something different. That's what they noticed with the disciples. If you remember in the book of Acts, they, they said that these are uneducated men, but they could tell that they had been with Christ. They were becoming like the one who had called them to follow him. You know, I don't know if you've heard of the book, The Christian Atheist. Have you read that by Craig Rochelle? But the premise of the book is to claim to have a belief in God, but then to act like he doesn't exist. There's this disconnect sometimes between what happens on a Sunday morning and how we live the rest of our lives. And discipleship, following Christ, as I mentioned earlier, is really all-inclusive. It means that I'm the same when I get home from church as I am in church. It means that I'm the same throughout the week, that my life exhibits evidence that Christ is in me. I share my faith. I love people. I hang out with some people that maybe others wouldn't because I'm not worried about stereotypes or what people might say, but I love people the way Jesus would have me to love people. And so if you would stand with me this morning, my challenge to all of us is are we willing to count the cost? Are we willing to, in spite of our unmet expectations, are we willing to, in spite of our failures, are we willing to, in spite of the distractions around us, commit to really following Christ, to giving everything to him, to have that fire in us, that passion in us, if you will, that no matter what goes on around me, no matter what's going on in the world, regardless of the economy, regardless of any, anything, Lord, I want to be like you because you believe in me because you're incredible and you have the ability, God, to make me like your son. That is his call on all of our lives, to follow him without holding back. And so in just a minute, I'm going to pray, and then I'm going to invite you when I'm finished praying. If you want to come up front, if you want to pray, there's the prayer pit, as I'm told it's called. You, please come forward. Maybe you're struggling with some expectations. Maybe things have not gone your way, and you're like, you know, Lord, I need to trust that your plan is far bigger and far greater than my experience now. And you need to commit to following him. Maybe you've gone through something and you're struggling, you've sinned, you've blown it. Well, this I know about God, that when we confess our sins, he's what? He's faithful and just to forgive us of our sins, to cleanse us of all unrighteousness. So maybe you need to come forward this morning and just make things right between you and God. Maybe you're distracted. Maybe you're just caught up in the busyness of life and it's stolen your focus and you want to recommit to Christ this morning, that, Lord, I'm going to follow you from this day forward no matter what. Or maybe you're here this morning, you've never asked Christ into your life. The good news is that Jesus came to this earth and he lived the perfect life, sinless life, and he died on the cross and he paid the penalty that all of our sin deserves. And for those who will ask Christ into their lives and receive him as Savior and Lord, God will forgive you of all your sins and he'll give you a brand new start and you'll just begin this journey just like Peter went on. And so if that's you this morning, in your own words and in your own way, ask Christ to come into your life. Ask God to forgive you. And then tell someone here this morning, I know there are resources they want to hand out to you to help you on your journey. So let's go ahead and pray. And then if that's you this morning, if you'd like to come forward, I invite you to come down. Father, we're so grateful that, Lord, you didn't just choose the best and the brightest and the most qualified. Lord, you went to people like us, just regular people. And you said to us, you gave us the privilege, you said, follow me to everyone in this building this morning, and I will make you. Our responsibility, Lord, is simply to follow you, to stay connected to you, to pursue you with everything that's within us. And Lord, you will move in incredible ways in our lives. And so, Father, I pray that you would challenge every one of us this morning. Speak to every heart in this place. And, God, I pray that you would do something special, something unique. God, even for those who come forward this morning to pray, God, would you come and have your way in every single one of us. And we love you and we praise you. In Jesus' name, amen.